Now, I'm not really exactly 100% sure exactly where we got cut off. So I'm just going to try to pick up on this respective slide, uh, specific problem situation number four in a 2v2 type of scenario or problem. And like we've talked about prior to this point, this type of activity really lends itself really nicely to true repetition without repetition. Remember, changing the number of opponents, changing the, the place that the opponent starts, um, the various opponents, the person who it actually is, their respective skill set, um, how Saquon himself is getting the ball. This type of activity is one that can be done in almost any learning environment, okay? But it actually would really allow Saquon himself some time and exposure and experience in being able to execute in more curvilinear fashions, really kind of find his gas pedal again and try to add some deceptive and creative nature to it as well. Uh, but on top of that, probably the most important thing that we'll get is, like we've talked about prior to this point, this simultaneous perception of teammate and opponent right here, the teammate and opponent, and then looking deeper. So the successive affordances, again, successive nested affordances, how Saquon solve this problem, whether he goes left, whether he sits and jukes, whether he goes to the right. I mean, he has the freedom and flexibility to explore this entire perceptual motor landscape, meaning how he interacts with the problem and how those problem solution dynamics unfold. Remember, we're going to incorporate and invoke Bernstein's idea of repetition without repetition here. No two problems the same, no two solutions the same. So now we have a tremendous amount of unpredictability, but we really give 26 here the capability to go and explore, uh, change the distance uh, or the space width as well as length. Uh, you change how far away the opponent is, change where this opponent is coming from. You could have this guy starting here. You could have him starting here. You could have him starting off the grid or off the grid over here. All of that will change the disposition of the problem, obviously. And I would recommend doing that literally every single rep. And so it allows him to connect and couple his movement in close relation to the unfolding problem, right? Uh, should, be, should be pretty intuitively obvious there. It should make some sense. Okay. So, and then our final specific problem situation, remember, like I mentioned in the, in earlier today, um, there's a whole host of movement problems that we can incorporate and utilize here and manipulate constraints around. These are ones that I just happened to select that would be some of my first early go-tos, but there's probably a list of 15 to 20 others that I would utilize here uh, for Saquon in particular. But this one in and of itself, the deep waters in this attunement and adaptability around successive affordances kind of encompasses everything that we're after, okay? To him, for Saquon Barkley to become more connected and coupled to the dynamically changing, ever-evolving, ever-emergent, constantly changing con uh, complex movement problem is really where he needs to exist, where his behavioral and organizational states must and should go. Okay, so by having more bodies in the space, both of the teammate sort, you can see right now on this respective problem, one, two, and three, we could adjust that, we could manipulate that, versus five opponents, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so you have a couple of teammate blocker um, type of defender dyads here, okay? And then you have a couple of free defenders back here. Uh, they could be simulating offense and defensive linemen. They could be simulating um, any level of the defense, depending on who you have at your disposal, right? Who within is in your learning environment. But it's here where we could really stretch Saquon's grip over the range of affordances. Get him to that place where he is scanning that entire landscape of affordances, okay? Not just getting this tunnel vision, not moving for movement's sake, not just reacting or making a quick, hasty decision, actually slowing down, becoming patient, getting attuned and sensitive wider, deeper and longer, right? Across the entire landscape. And then adapting within adapting, 
right? What do I mean by that? You guys have heard me say that, that before. He would be in this constant state of adaptability where how he moves will be dependent on what's happening in the disposition of this bigger global problem. But as Saquon moves himself, that problem changes. So let's say he were to go to his left. Obviously, this guy could fill this gap or he could fill that one, depending on what he picked up. Remember, behavior affords behavior. Let's imagine that he did go to this space and he's now occupying this hole right here. He has to make this guy miss in the hole or maybe he came over here and the hole has opened up and he's got to attune to this one. Okay. So really what I'm saying here, this could unfold in any number of different ways. Okay. Behavior affords behavior. So how one's opponent or teammates acts and behaves will determine how Saquon himself could act or behave. So it would require this deep connection and coupling guys and gals. I I'm not showing you anything here that is overly rocket science. Okay. But remember the true worth of the sport movement specialist is not just in designing the problems that are going to stretch in the grip over the field of affordances for that respective player, the ones that represent that player's gaps, but it's also in how that individual interacts in that learning environment. So this is where I think it would be really fun, at least for me as a sport movement specialist, to attempt to facilitate the education of attention, which is, is a fancy way of saying what information in the world is he connecting to, and educate the intention. So assisting Saquon in becoming more open and responsive and what he must do that in interaction with. And then again, adaptability will flow on the backside of that. So think of how many different ways he can move to not only come into this problem, he could take a handoff, he could take a catch and a reception, he could be moving into it at an angle, uh, he could just be starting from a stationary spot. Every single one of these parties in the space, in that workspace, could be changing their initial conditions. A whole host of things, really nothing is off limits. You could create a whole day around this intention and around these objectives. Absolutely, without a doubt, because no two problems are truly ever going to be the same here. And this would require him, first and foremost, to be that sensitive, to actually connect to the information of the world around him, make some mistakes, see what works, see what doesn't, find the true fit of the integrated movement solution here. Okay, So this would probably be my favorite activity, even though each one of them that came before this were ones that I feel would be highly beneficial to Saquon. As we wind down our time here together, getting deep down into the um, movement skills and movement skill set of Saquon Barkley. There is this elephant in the room that I've talked about in the past, in particular in the 2018 um, draft analysis, as well as then again in the mover of the year, the 230 plus pound elephant in the room, right? My question that I've always asked of Saquon is, does it and is it really benefiting him as much as he believes that it is? to either A, be 230 pounds, or B, chase that which what comes with it, such as maximal strength or force production. And the, the answer to that question, obviously only Saquon himself knows, because I don't know the last time that he was, say, maybe 220-ish, but I would love to see what Saquon Barkley would do with his fluidity, um, his continuity of movements, what types of positions he could get into, what kind of patterns he could execute from, what other strategies would naturally emerge, how much lighter and freer he would feel if, again, he wasn't 233 or 234 and he was maybe in that 220 to 222 range. I know it seems excessive, especially when he's probably been chasing this since well before his Penn State days, when he knew he had to get bigger and stronger in order to get faster, more explosive, and get his opportunity in the National Football League. But guys and gals, that's no longer the case. In fact, if he keeps chasing some of these ideals, it, it's going to be this smaller and smaller and smaller room for adaptation, number one. It's going to take a lot more time, energy, and effort to lift heavy and to maintain that weight, but also it's going to be harder on his body. It absolutely positively will be harder on his body. And finally, when I say, does it really benefit him to be this heavy? Let's remember that his most authentic self, his most expressive and honest style 
really comes when he's feeling himself. And I mean that in a good way, when he's creative and adaptable and adjusting aspects of his movement strategies. Which one, meaning which body weight, that 230 plus pounds or, or maybe something closer to 220, which one would benefit that type of style more? And uh, I think it's pretty clear as to which one could or would. And uh, that would require probably some change in his own opinion. It would require a bit of ch change in ego, probably to a certain degree, because um, you know, it, wouldn't no, it would no longer be about having the, the quadzilla type of way, right? The say quads, but instead having a, a body that could move freer and easier, and it could be easier to get in certain positions and, and coordinate some things together. I think that there is some, uh, this is one of the lower hanging fruits that uh, if he and I ever partnered together, I would be banging on the drum being like, hey, let's just see how you feel, how you look, how you behave when we lose four, eight, maybe 10 or 12 pounds. Um, just something to think about, especially in this day and age in the NFL, very short shelf life for National Football League players. You want to be more efficient um, in order to be more effective for the long haul. Guys and gals, uh, obviously, I really highly enjoyed taking this deep dive into Saquon Barkley and, and some of the things that represents the gaps and the opportunities in his movement skill set, as well as what makes him do what he does and what makes him tick. Obviously, I've done a number of features on Saquon over the years. You can find and check those out at footballbeyondthestats.wordpress.com. Just type in Saquon Barkley on the search engine bar, and you're going to find a bunch of plays of the week. You're going to find his pre-draft movement analysis. You're going to find his mover of the year. You're going to find a bunch of different things about Saquon Barkley there. Um, I do hope, sincerely hope that this was beneficial for you all, those who've listened to this point. I hope it gave you some ideas for your own learning environment. If Saquon Barkley ever happens to listen to this, um, hopefully he was able to, to absorb what was useful, maybe discard what is not and add what is uniquely his own to the mix, you know, kind of taking and stealing from Bruce Lee. Um, but I hope some things resonated for you out there, and particularly if Saquon Barkley would ever hear this, um, because I do believe that Saquon has the potential still possesses the potential to be the most dexterous, most skillful mover in all of the National Football League. One final shout out. Obviously, if, if you have questions, thoughts, ideas, put them in the comment section below. If there's a player that you want to see me get into the movement skill set of in this upcoming feature um, that I'm going to do here in the spring and the summer, um, go ahead and put that name in the the box below. Otherwise, you can hit me up as Sean at emergentmovementmvmt.com. And if these ideas that form my form of life, that shape my form of life, um, are intriguing to you, I would highly recommend checking out uh, emergentmovement.com. And you can see it there. Uh, we have a bunch of different courses that address some of these topics, some of these ideas at much, much greater depth. Uh, guys and gals, this was fun. This was enjoyable. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. Saquon Barkley, go uh, get yourself connected and coupled. And I think on the other side, Saquon 2.0 might actually exist.